Here we are. Hello, good evening, everyone. Welcome, Hi, welcome to the fourth Pioneer Vienna event. We will be starting in one minute. So please fasten your seatbelt and uh, get ready. Good, we already have uh, 42 people connected. That's about a quarter of the people who were registered on the meetup page. I hope we'll get a double of that at least. Welcome everyone, good evening. Or good morning, I mean, I know that's now that uh, the events have been promoted also by the news of deep learning AI. We also have basically an audience from pretty much anywhere in the world. So I'm not sure, good evening, good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our meetup. All right, so welcome to the fourth Pioneer AI Vienna. Uh, this is co-organized by the Vienna Data Science Group here and the Deep Learning AI as part of the event series across the world. So let me introduce the agenda for today. So first, I will give you a, first, a quick introduction of the Vienna Data Science Group that you know exactly who we are and why we organize these kind of events. And then I will show the traditional Android uh, greeting video that uh, they recorded uh, few months back in the offices in California. And then at 5.15, so in uh, about 30 minutes from now, we will start our main talk. So today I invited Claudius Kasha, who is the co-founder and also the head of data science for Mostly AI, and he will talk to, about, talk to us about why we should be using AI-generated fake data um, in operation or businesses. And after his talk, which will last about 30 minutes, we will have 15 minutes for questions and answers. So please note that for your questions, uh, you can simply post your question in the chat and, uh, and I will just uh, pass them on to, to the speaker for doing the moderation. All right, so what about the Vienna Data Science Group? Uh, Vienna Data Science Group is a nonprofit organization based in Vienna, Austria. Uh, that is a promoting data science and data scientist and really um, you know put up put up a platform a network for for promoting uh, these topics in the industry and in academia and help people you know get to know each other network uh, we organize or co-organize lots of events uh, there are these meetups that we have not only the pi AI, there are other stuff you can look it up on the, on the meetup page also also conferences uh, and we partner with similar organizations all across Europe as well um, in terms of, of collaboration that we have. Uh, also, you can check our website. We have all the news there and we also have a job board. So if your data center is looking for a job, you can check up uh, what's up there. Or if you are from a company and looking for to hire data scientists, you can also have us uh, uh, repost some of your, of your job, uh, job ads. All right, just uh, quickly to show our sponsors. Uh, we have currently five sponsors, uh, local, Viennese uh, local Viennese and Austrian companies, uh, Connexto, Freedom, Data, Gradient, Informants, and Uni Software Plus. Uh, they, they really um, help us uh, financially to, to get a bit of structure and then promote our events further. Finally, um, so it's not just a VDSG event, it's all a deep learning AI event. Uh, there is a link posted on the meetup page where uh, of a survey you can fill up uh, for deep learning AI people, uh, just to know exactly who you are and why you're attending this. If you fill this up, uh, you will get a discount for the deep learning AI courses, which are on Coursera. Um, it's quite interesting because you know the past months they've put up a bunch of new of new specializations. We said the deep learning specialization. There is one for uh, deep learning and machine learning for for medical application. And recently, they started a new a new specialization for natural language processing. So, please, if if you want to get this discount, just just fill up uh, fill up this survey. All right, uh, let's go with the greeting video from Andrew Ang, which he was recording a few months back. Here we are. Good evening, Andrew. Hello, deep learners. I'm Andrew Ng, founder of DeepLearning.ai, and I'm excited to welcome you to our global deep learning community. 
I know that many of you are here today because you want to break into AI and build your career. I hope that being part of this community will help you to do so. To give you a proper welcome, I'd like to show you around the deep learning.ai offices and meet some of the teams so that you can see where it all happens. Oh, hi, Andrew. Um, do you want to tell our friends at Pine AI what you do at Deep Learning.ai? Sure. Hi, everyone. I, I make articles and other media that help people learn about AI and help them understand the huge impact that AI is having in the world. Today, I'm putting together the next issue of The Batch, our weekly newsletter, and I'm looking for the biggest stories of the week to keep our readers informed. What's been the most surprising thing you've run into working on The Batch? How much is going on in this field? There is never a dull moment. I, you know, you might think from the outside that machine learning engineers really understand everything about AI, but nobody understands everything about AI because this field is just coming to life right before my eyes as I put this thing together every week. All right, I know you're really busy, so let's you get back to it. Thanks, see you later. Let's go meet Kian, who helped me create the deep learning specialization. He's working on an exciting new project. Hey, Kian. So, do you want to tell the people at Pine AI what you're working on? Yes, sure. Um, I'm leading a project called Workera, uh, focusing on helping uh, people get offers uh, in AI and navigating their career by uh, testing their skills, uh, preparing for interviews and certifying them, as well as uh, matching and referring them to good jobs in AI. That's really cool. And what's the most exciting part of your day? You know, the AI field is new, uh, organizations and jobs are still misunderstood. So I'm excited to help people understand what different types of jobs exist in the field, uh, what tasks they will work on, and what skills are needed to achieve those tasks. That's really important work. Well, it's nice chatting. And now let's go chat to Otao, who is on their product team. Do you want to say hi to our friends at Pine AI and let them know what you're working on? I would love to. Hi everyone. I lead the product team in deeplearning.ai where we create AI education content accessible to people all around the world. People like you. And what are you most excited about right now? I am so excited to see our community grow and to see how eager people are to learn more about AI. Thanks also. Thanks. So, as you can see, our team is working hard to support you and help you learn. It's never been easier than before to break into AI. So, if you want to build a career, you can leverage online resources available, including open source code, data sets, papers, and online courses like a deep learning specialization on Coursera. As part of this journey, I hope you get your hands dirty too. Don't be afraid of diving in to build your own project or go ahead and try to replicate a research paper that you're excited about. One thing that I've seen help a lot of people succeed is if you can build a community or find a community of fellow deep learners you can meet with and study with on a regular basis. In fact, I hope that this Pine AI meetup that you're at right now will be a good place for you to meet these people. I hope you enjoyed the event today and that you learn a lot, both from the talks and from each other. And once again, welcome to the deeplearning.ai community. Thank you much, Andrew. So let's proceed with our agenda. I see we have already more than 70 people registered uh, and connected. Uh, I would like to show you again the agenda for today. So for those who just joined during the video, uh, welcome to the fourth uh, Pioneer Vienna event. Uh, this is Charles Dietz, uh, live from Vienna, from Scalable Offices, from the Vienna Data Science Group. So, right now, uh, I would like to introduce our speakers. So, for this session, I invited uh, Claudius Kalscher, or shall I say, Dr. Claudius Kalscher. He is um, he's already a graduate from the Technical University in Vienna in Data Engineering and Statistics. And after that, he's done a PhD in Medical Physics at the Medical University of Vienna. 
And after working a couple of years as a data scientist uh, in, the, in, the, in the industry, he has founded uh, three and a half years ago a company called Mosley, uh, Mosley.ai, which uh, provides very interesting solution and actually the market leading solution for anonymizing uh, data sets, especially uh, user, user data, which are privacy sensitive. So uh, Claudius, uh, thank you very much for joining. Yeah, the stage is yours if you would like to start with your with your presentation. And I know you have a poll ready for us to start. Thank you very much. Yeah, thanks for inviting me here. Uh, great opportunity to uh, to present some interesting insights about synthetic data uh, to the community. And uh, maybe <laughs> small caveat: we're not marketing in, in anonymizing data per se, um, but certainly in the in uh, AI generated. Um, synthetic data for enterprises. Uh, right, so with that, let me draw up my slides here. Um, as you know from the, the title of this talk, I will talk to you about why you should start using fake data. And if you're wondering who this person here on the left is, who has no resemblance with me whatsoever, that's because that person does not not exist. And it's the first example of uh, a fake data set <laughs> that I'm showing you today. Uh, and many of you will be aware of these, these types of um, research um, results and uh, generative networks. So I might want to start with a quick poll. Um, and could you please share how your experience with generative deep learning networks is? Have you heard of it, never heard of it, read about it, interested in it? Um, or actually using them on a day-to-day -day basis or regularly uh, already. I wait a few seconds for results to come in. It looks like uh, everyone has at least heard of it. Oh, almost everyone. <laughs> Most people have at least heard of it. Um, I can. Well, good to see that people did enjoy this meetup just randomly. Uh, obviously, they have heard about a topic before. But yeah. there is little proficiency. So since the majority, 72% of people, 73, have yeah. only heard about it and only 18% have experimented with it before. Yeah. Results are getting more stable here. I think, can we publish the results when we end the poll? Uh, so it's, seven, yeah, three quarters have heard of it, um, but never experienced it. 20% have some practical experience. Um, yeah, that that's great because then, uh, if you heard about it and are interested in it, but don't yet have any practical experience, then uh, that might be a good starting point for me to jump right in. And um, the the images I showed you are from a, a published paper here um, that is termed, um, uh, I forgot the name of the paper exactly, but it's a style gun is the name of the model and it uh, can generate faces at a very, very realistic, um, level and you can go to this website this person does not exist.com um, and really get any number of fake pictures if you if you need some um, which leads me to the question can you actually easily spot who of, uh, of two pi uh, pictures who is actually a real person and uh, who is fake and with that uh, Let me just quick, uh, start a quick new poll here. Which of these two would you think is the fake image, A or B? First results are coming in. Uh, pretty interesting results so far. Uh, and uh, if you find this question interesting in, in uh, trying to find out what the fake is here, um, I'll give you some hints uh, at, the, at the end of this talk. So if you bear <laughs> with us to the end of the talk, I talk a bit about how you can spot the fake one and uh, also give you a solution for this one. Right, so I think the results are starting to stabilize here. Um, maybe I, I won't tell the results right now. Um, Let's keep this for the end. Up to you, Claudius. But so the reason is like, so almost, yeah, three quarters of people think that the picture B is the fake one. 
and A and 25% basically think A is the right. yeah. is the true one. So yeah. no, 20, 23% think A is the fake one and 76 Sorry, sorry, okay, the other way around. Yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, so pretty interesting. Um, there's a clear favorite here. <laughs> Um, yeah, but it's, it's not just images, uh, as you might have known um, from reading the literature about generative models. You have generative models in, in different domains, text being one very, um, very fascinating one. And uh, this led to about a month ago, um, this article in The Guardian that has entirely been written by GPT-3, the uh, text generative, uh, generating model. Um, that's currently leading the field here with a couple of samples. Um, yeah, but while this is all very fascinating, uh, the main question that is, uh, is still out there is, well, okay, this is nice, this is interesting, I get it, but why would I want to use any of this? And so uh, this will be the topic of this talk today. I'll show you a couple of examples um, why you might want to use fake data and what you can do with them, what uh, the fake data can achieve for you, um, even though it might be really counterintuitive to think of in machine learning using fake data instead of real data. If you have real data, why not just use them? Uh, and the first reason, and probably the one that I hear most, is privacy. Um, the reason behind this is that anonymization is really hard. Uh, and and this, with these images, I just show you some examples. Um, how much information um, do you need to remove from some data to really make them anonymous? And the the more higher dimensional your data set gets, the harder it is to really draw a line here. Because if you leave too much information, you still still leave your data subjects exposed to potential uh, de-anonymization or re-identification. So how much do you need to protect? Is, is something like this enough? Uh, or is this enough? Or maybe is only this really private? And I would claim that this is the only image where you cannot uh, recognize the person anymore, even though if you have these ears here uh, protruding out left and right, maybe a machine learning algorithm would still um, be able to recognize uh, Mr. Obama here. Why, why is this so difficult? Um, any of these te classic anonymization techniques try to find a trade-off by removing some of the information of the original data, um, but trying to leave um, as much as possible intact so that you can still um, put this data to some use. So on the left-hand side here, you have data that is fully useful, but not private at all. And over on the right, this is perfectly private, but also useless. And you see in this example here with images, uh, a point that I'm coming back to in a second, um, that's true for all kinds of high dimensional data. You can go really far off to the right while still being able to recognize the, the person in this image. Um, and only at the point where you really destroy almost all of the information, do you really, can you really claim that um, it's not possible to re-identify the individual anymore. And why is this the case? This is because of uh, the curse of dimensionality. And I assume that most people will already have heard of it. But to sum it up for those who haven't, the curse of dimensionality means that the more high dimensional a data set is, the farther the individual data points are away from each other, and the more unique every single data point is in this space. And it's no one is really similar to anyone else in a high dimensional space. And so while for small data, it may be possible to remove some of the data, I think it's, it's uh, not, per, not perhaps, perhaps not easy to read here, but here you have a data record of Alexander van der Bellen with a date of birth, uh, residence, numbers of children, academic degree, income, employment. And this is obviously fully uh, full utility and no privacy. You can remove a bit if you have still have the date of birth, uh, number of children, academic degree, employment and uh, an income in this bracket between 20k and 30k that might still be unique so it's not not probably not private uh, and then the next step um, removes more of the information and here we're probably 
already private because uh, this description here with just a year of birth, uh, children, yes, no, residence, just a city, um, and, and very broad brackets for the income. This would probably fit a lot of different people. Uh, and so this can be considered private and still has some relevant information that you could use for some analytics. For big data, however, as, as, as soon as you have more high dimensional data, the trade-off curve looks different. It's not going on this upper right corner where you would like to be, where you have both utility and privacy at the same time, but rather the curve is going on the, this, this lower right corner of this plot where you basically lose a lot of the information and really only once you've destroyed almost all of it, do you even begin to see any improvement in, in terms of privacy. And the same is true for all kinds of different data. And, and leads to a high re-identification risk for um, many different data sets that are in this that, that have this general property. So, for example, uh, if you take mobile phone signals, two antenna signals, even if it's just coarsened to the hour of the day and uh, the the cell tower uh, level, not much more detail than that, and you can draw them randomly from the complete history of an individual are uniquely identifying 51% of individuals. So think about that. That means that um, really very, very little information about any uh, movement patterns can be retained if you want to have any sense of privacy in this. Um, credit card owners is also a very good example where three transactions would identify 80% of credit card owners, even if you have only the merchant and the date of the transaction, nothing more, no uh, uh, transaction sum and no hour, time of day. Or this third example is probably the most well known of these, that 87% of individuals can be identified by just the date of birth, gender and zip code. And to show you one example of how easy it is to use this information for re-identification, um, the Netflix prize was um, basically a, a data science bounty um, made by Netflix uh, about 13 years ago, where they they published um, movie ratings in a table that looked like this here on the right with some movies. So you had movie IDs, the year of the movie, the title on, in one table, and then the other table had the user ID, movie ID, and then the, the rating, uh, and then the date, which is here, uh, 9th of March 2004 for each of these. Um, and that's it, no more than this. But because this user ID links a lot of these different movie IDs and, and ratings together, you can basically make, make a profile of these individuals. And soon after they published this, uh, researchers found that with just three or four movies, you could re-identify the person with this user ID in a second data set that they would match with this first data set um, and then identify individuals. Now you might ask what was the second data set? Um, that was the Internet Movie Database, IMDB, where you can also look at uh, movie ratings from different individuals. And because of the curse of dimensionality, it is, so unlikely that, that there's two people who would have watched the same movie in roughly the same, uh, roughly the same date. And I think they use plus minus two week windows for that between the movie watch time in Netflix and the rating in uh, IMDb. Uh, that just matching these um, people who had watched the same movies or watched the same movies and uh, rated them in IMDb to really identify all of a large proportion of IMDb users in the Netflix database. And so these types of research results have, uh, or maybe I, I can just go back to this here at the, at the end, the uh, conclusion that the researchers made here was that no amount of perturbation uh, can ever be enough to anonymize the data set unless it would completely destroy the utility because of this curse of dimensionality. And this led also um, newspapers to pick up the story and, um, and and really write about it. And so this is now becoming part of a, a more general understanding, even in a wider non-technical audience, that there's no such thing as anonymized data. You cannot just anonymize a data set and then 
uh, it's not possible to identify the individuals in it anymore. And you have lots and lots of these headlines that uh, relate to different data breaches um, that, that had some anonymous or um, data that should have been anonymous uh, at the base. Why is this the case? Uh, and I, I'm using this graph here, usually just as a, as a graph like this without any annotation, so you might think it's just a, a schematic. Um, the problem that I'm describing here is that there's a hard cap of the amount of information that you can release with classic anonymization, because as soon as you have these two or three data points on the same individual, it's possible to match it with some other sources, and because every individual is so unique, it's impossible uh, to just change it slightly or make it coarser or, or do any slight modification around it, but have the same underlying, the real underlying data modified in a way that you cannot find out who this individual is. Um, but since this is a more technical audience, I'll give you a number here as well. And the number is basically 33 bits. And this has nothing at all to do with any particular technical details of an anonymization technique. This is because there's 8 billion people on this planet, and with 33 bits, you can theoretically differentiate all of them. And of course, your real data will not have this, this extremely um, sharp um, um, distinction between all of uh, all individuals. So this is a theoretical uh, maximum. But even if you have some overlap, um, there, there will be people who are completely unique because they don't match anyone. And um, the space is really um, uh, so sparse that that um, you cannot. So the, the the bits here are really very can really be very broad um, piece of information that differentiate between one person and everyone else. Right. And so what can be done for this? And this is where um, fake data come back in. And with AI generated data like the, the ones you saw here uh, with images, you can actually solve this issue because you can then publish data sets like these images that, that have the full complexity, the, the, the shapes and patterns of the real thing that was uh, on, on which you trained your generative model without disclosing anything about anyone in particular. So you can have uh, a basis for machine learning without exposing anyone that has been contributing to the real data set to any privacy risk. And um, this is being increasingly understood by, by the media as well. So you might see that the, the media here are more on the tech savvy side, but still um, people start understanding that synthetic data will be the way to handle this conundrum between uh, privacy and, and really needs to use data. And uh, what really makes this different than any classic anonymization approaches is that because with deep learning models behind this, you can increase the, the complexity of the model and also th therefore increase the level of detail that you can retain and that, that you can have in the synthetic data with the amount of information um, in your training data increasing. So the more data you have, the more you can, the better the model will be. And so the more detailed and the uh, the, the synthetic data will be, and so the more value you can get out of it. And this will really changes uh, the playing field completely from these classic anonymization techniques that were bound because you, they always had real individuals underneath it um, that you could basically trace the, the original records back to. Right, so how can you then actually measure how accurate some, some of these synthetic data are? And uh, the first, uh, so it, it's an unsupervised learning problem. So it's really an open challenge. There's no hard and fast rule to say this is an accurate data and, and this is an inaccurate data. Um, so the first way of, of handling this was uh, is a Turing test. And uh, this is basically, can humans tell the difference? So this is basically the experiment I did at the beginning with the poll. Um, how easy is it? How many people are uh, fooled by a, a fake image? or by a synthetic data set. How likely would you uh, be to rate the fake image or the fake data as real ones? And if humans cannot tell the difference, uh, then probably it's pretty accurate. But it's, it's kind of a fuzzy metric, so it's hard to really test. So there's a couple of more 
um, hard and fast rules that we can apply to really measure accuracy. And I'll, I'll uh, tell you a bit about those and, and how you can evaluate data accuracy um, in the field of synthetic data generation. Right, so let's, let's start with a, a Turing test on structured data. So for images, there might be still some um, intuition of what a real image should look like, and so it's easier to really tell the difference. For a structured data set like this here, this is the US Census data set um, from Kaggle, um, basically records from the 1994 US Census, and you have fields like age, work class, um, a final weight, education, uh, marital status, occupation. You can look at these and uh, you would say, okay, um, this looks plausible. I, I don't see any uh, any weird contradictions here. Let's see if I see any on the right-hand side with the synthetic data. Um, well, uh, let's see here, relationship and sex. So most husbands are male and wives are female. That That's pretty much what you would expect. And you don't have any clashes with, with expectations. So yeah, there's nothing that would... Uh, any of these discrepancies that could occur. So let's look at a couple of more distributions. Um, if you compare here, for example, univariate distributions, uh, we could see, okay, the synthetic data have the same distribution as the real data. Yeah, that, that's basically one of the prerequisites. If that wasn't the case, you would immediately be able to tell, yeah, that, that, that's fake. That's not what the real world looks like. Um, however, univariate distributions are also pretty easy to get right. So you, you, um, could just sample from uh, marginal distributions and then uh, create a data set from all of these sampled uh, values. This would get all of these distributions here perfectly right, but would still um, lead to probably nonsensical combinations between different features. So what we really need to do is drill down into uh, more complex relationships, for example, bivariate relationships. So here, for example, we have a relationship between age and, and marital status. People who are 17 to 25 are more likely to be never married. Married than um, the, the likelihood of being married increases with age. And so on the left, uh, that on the left hand side is the target data. On the right hand side, synthetic data. This is one way of visually comparing um, these different distributions and uh, confirming, kind of like a quantitatively extended Turing test, whether uh, this data set looks like it's uh, its original counterpart or not. Um, summing this up in, in more detail, we could do some uh, uh, correlation matrix. You can see here the, all the correlations between two variables. Darker fields are higher correlations. Uh, and we could look at the synthetic data and see which of these uh, are uh, identical and in which cases there might be some differences. And you can, can see here, okay, there's maybe here these two fields where there's a, a correlation that does not look exactly as it was in the original. It's basically a spuriously introduced correlation here. Um, right. Um, summing all of this up, you could also make uh, define a, a quantitative metric. And this is one that we use uh, at Mostly AI, where we will basically measure the maximum discrepancies in any of these bivariate plots here. Uh, and then this, the maximum deviation in any of these plots would be the accuracy of this pair of plots, uh, pair of variables, and then measure the total accuracy score as uh, one minus or 100% minus this maximum deviation, and then averaging it over the entire matrix. So this gives us uh, a tool that, that helps interpreting whether a, a synthetic data result is actually representative of the real world. But th this is just descriptive statistics. You might be, you might want to look in a bit more into uh, more details for machine learning. If you really want to use these data for machine learning use cases, do you really trust the model trained on these synthetic data to work on the real one? And so um, one way of evaluating this is splitting the original data into a holdout data set and a training data set, um, as you would uh, in, a, in a pretty standard machine learning pipeline. And then the training data, you can either train the model directly on it as you would normally do, or first introduce this synthetic data generation step, generate synthetic data from it, and then train the machine learning model on that as you would otherwise. Uh, and, and I put this box here with repeating this a hundred times because this is one thing I did in, in my experiments here. 
uh, I repeated this 100 times to evaluate how much variability, how much noise would be introduced by this synthetic data generation process and, and how noisy the models would then get um, before comparing the results with um, the models trained on the original training data. And so using the same data as I showed you before, the US Census data, the prediction target is to predict whether an individual has an income of below 50K or above 50K. Uh, and you can see that the accuracy of the model trained on the real data is about 85.6%. And with the model trained on synthetic data, you would get something like 84.4% plus minus 0.3%. Uh, so it's pretty close. It's um, one percentage point below the accuracy that you got on with training the, the model on real data. So it's something that you can uh, you can you can quantify it um, how close you are on on the real data models. Uh, and the accuracy might not be the best metric in many cases. So another metric to be to look at would be the area under the curve of an ROC curve. Uh, here we also see something similar. We have a, about a one percentage point drop uh, in, in the actual value, um, pretty low variability here. Um, so this can also give us some confidence in, in what kind of deviation we would expect if we use synthetic data instead of real data. Um, on the right hand side, you can also see some variable importance plots. And this is also particularly interesting in my point of view because um, variable importance means that the model can be interpreted in some meaningful way, right? And so here you can see for each of these variables, a red dot that is the variable importance value that you would get from training the model on the real data. And then a box plot where the different uh, models trained on these hundred different synthetic data sets would put this uh, variable importance. And you can see that the order of the variable importance is pretty consistently exactly the, the, the one that you have in the real data. So you can really interpret a model that has been trained on synthetic data and draw conclusions from this on the real world, which I think is really fascinating. Now, with all of this talk about accuracy, you might also um, ask, now, how would you evaluate privacy? Because if you are um, too close to the real data, obviously you can have a very high accuracy, but that doesn't really, wouldn't fulfill the purpose of being a privacy sensitive alternative to using real data. And so what we do in, uh, in our evaluations is using some metrics that measure, um, so we, we would split the data uh, into target data and a holder data set, and then measure the distance in various metrics of the synthetic data to its nearest neighbors in the target data here. And then we would look at the distances between the holdout data and the target data. And the idea here is the synthetic data should not be closer to their nearest neighbors in the target data than the distance between holdout data and their nearest neighbor in the target data is, right? So that means um, any synthetic data point is no more similar to any real individual than another individual that has not been in the training would also be to the same uh, nearest neighbor um, in the real target data. And the three metrics we use here are, first of all, identical matches, because in some data you have an effect where, where some uh, combinations are just so frequent that you have a lot of identical records in the data. Then if you don't have identical records, or if that's not the main issue, the distance to the closest record, really a, a distance in the, the um, in the data space. But this does not take into account that in a more central part of the data, distances between data points are naturally uh, shorter. And in more outlying parts of the data, those are data points that might be more sensitive to privacy leaks. Um, the distances between real data points are larger. P data points are further apart because they are more, uh, more unlike each other. And to take this into account, we don't just measure the distance to the closest record, um, but would also measure the nearest neighbor distance ratio, which is the ratio between the distance to the closest record and the distance to the second closest record. And that means we kind of normalize the distances by what the distances between different uh, real target data data points in this broad area of the data space is. 
And this gives us an approximation um, for, for this effect that we are, we need to be further apart from outliers than we need to be from, from a more densely packed space in the data. And so the idea here is we should be as close as possible to the distribution of distances with the holdup data, but not any closer. If we are, if the distances are longer than the distances between holdup data and target data, this means that the, the, the fit is not very good, that um, there might be some other differences in the distribution between these two. Uh, so the sweet spot would really be having the exact same di distribution of distances in all of these three metrics with the synthetic data as you would with the holdup data. And the second way of measuring it would be um, trying to uh, build an uh, attribute inference attack model. By that, I mean, can I infer the a particular sensitive attribute from a person who has been in the training data um, by building a model on top of these synthetic data? And um, the way to evaluate this would be uh, this two-step process here. First, we would train a machine learning model to predict a sensitive attribute on the real data. And then if we uh, predict this sensitive attribute for someone for whom we know a couple of the other attributes, um, then if that is revealing too much information about that individual, for example, if the model was overfit, then the likelihood of guessing this correctly would be higher than if that person hasn't been in the training data. So basically, we compare the accuracy of such a model for uh, for each of these individuals here. Uh, I term these individuals uh, privacy canaries, like the canaries in the coal mine. Um, and then if I remove just this one individual from the data and train the model again on the rest of the data, how accurate is my model prediction of my model's prediction of this individual then? And what you see is that different models would have different propensity to overfit. And you can see this drop, for example, here for the random forest model from 49.8% to 39.7%. So really a big drop in accuracy by just removing this one person from the training data. And then to investigate synthetic data, we would synthesize this data set and then synthesize this data set and then train the machine learning model on this synthetic data set and on this one. And what you can see is that the accuracy that we get on the synthetic data, uh, but on a model trained on the synthetic data that has been trained on the real data, including that canary, is the same as you would have for the model that has not seen this individual in the first place. So basically, you would uh, eliminate any effect of this person having been in this real data set. Uh, so any potentially revealing information is removed by producing a synthetic data set on top of this first, and then training the machine learning model on the synthetic data only. Right. Um, I see that I'm running a bit out of time, but uh, I just want to share a few insights here about how behavioral data can be even more complex. So if you have multiple interactions with the same customers, like you had in the Netflix data set, then you might have more complicated metrics. Maybe I, I skip over these in, uh, and then you can uh, look at these in more details in the slides afterwards. Um, and then the, the last topic here for privacy, I want to talk about is mobility data, where um, this is really, really notoriously hard. And, and so the New York Times had this article at the beginning of the year with the researcher t saying that precise geolocation is absolutely impossible to anonymize. DNA is probably the only thing that's harder to anonymize than precise geolocation information. And so my, my colleagues working on uh, geolocation data synthetization were like, hold my beer, I try this out. Um, and so the problem why mobility data is hard is that you, there's a, a wealth of research and um, you cannot really coarsen the data. I've shown a few of these examples at the beginning. If, even if you coarsen the data, uh, in terms of geographical resolution, temporal resolution, the uh, percentage of, of um, the uniqueness here does not go uh, down very fast. So even uh, so with three data points um, here, this is the, the number we had before, 80% 80, 80 would be re-identified by three data points. Um, 
but this number only goes from 80% to let's say 30%, even if you uh, reduce the temporal the, uh, resolution to nine hours instead of one hour and the spatial resolution also by a factor of nine. And so a good example for this is the, the Porto taxi data set. It's a fully uh, open data set about taxi trips in Porto that look like a bit like this. You have these geolocation pairs here for the full trajectory. And this is what it looks like on the map. And so yeah, my colleagues tried out, tried this out and synthesized this and found that um, you can build realistic taxi trips that here, this is just single locations on the real data here, holdout data and the synthetic data on the bottom. And you can see that the location would match what real locations um, look like, but it's not just about individual locations, it's really about the trips. And even if you drill down at the individual trip level, you can see that the trips that you would have in the synthetic data would still give you a high level of accuracy. Down to the point where you can produce different metrics for these trips, distances, radius of gyration, straightness of the trips, and all of these metrics match the real data, even though they were never in, this distribution was never explicit in the data at any point. It was really just time and um, locations at each time point. Right, so this was about privacy. And I, I promised that I'd give you multiple reasons. So I just um, give you a quick overview on different other reasons to use synthetic data. And one would be accuracy. Why? Because some data might be imbalanced or you don't have enough training examples of some specific uh, uh, categories. And in this case, augmenting data with synthetic data can help improve accuracy quite a lot. And obviously how much improvement you would get depends on the classifier you, you're using for something too simple like logistic regression. You don't see any improvement by, by using static data in addition, but something that uses local information like a random forest or XGBoost, uh, you're able to really increase accuracy by oversampling and making it easier for these classifiers to find the correct decision boundary and rebalancing the classes. And the third one that I also want to mention, um, and I'm particularly proud of uh, research we did in this domain, um, also a couple of colleagues of mine worked on this earlier this year, uh, and this was mentioned in yesterday's batch in the Deep Learning AI uh, newsletter as well, um, that you can also use synthetic data to correct for biases. So for example, in the um, US Census data that I showed you previously, you have a big gender gap in income. Um, this is from 1994, uh, and, and this was just the reality in the data back then. Now, if you want to create a model that does not have this bias ingrained, you need to take this bias out during model training. What you can also do is taking this model out of the data in the first place and train the model on not the real data set, but on a synthetic data set that looks more like the world you would like to have. So, of course, it's introducing a certain type of bias, but it's really not about um, a, a different type of bias in a statistical sense, right? So it would uh, correct for the bias that you have in the real data and then balance these classes out. And what's really fascinating here is if you look at these correlation matrix matrices, uh, similar to the ones I showed you before, you can see that there's here this correlation between income and sex in the original data and in the synthetic data, this one specifically with a very, uh, uh, very high specificity. This has been removed while re leaving all of the other relationships between all of the other variables very much intact. And so you can really very specifically change data in ways that you want them to be uh, changed to remove these types of biases. Right, and uh, with that, I would encourage you to also try it out yourself. There's a uh, two GitHub repos that I want to point you to. This one, uh, the first one is from us. It's called the Virtual Data Lab. Uh, you can see a, a Google Colab um, notebook from our data lab where you can really uh, start, um, try this out and uh, get a first hands-on impression of what synthetic data uh, generation could look like. There's also a, another um, one that's pretty popular for um, uh, single table examples. Ours is more focused on uh, event type of data. This one, the second one is from the MIT lab. Um, uh, yeah, you can also check this one out. So these two can give you a good starting point to investigate. Um, and with that, I uh, thank you and want to encourage you to think about what you could do with access to unlimited data.
and maybe one more point before I'm heading to QA. I promised you some uh, little bonus here, uh, a short guide to spotting fake faces. So at the poll at the beginning, uh, we had these, these two images, uh, one of them being fake. These are the images from the original paper. Uh, and I just use uh, this here to show a couple of examples of what you might look like, uh, investigate. So is there anything, Charles, is there anything you see on this, these images that immediately look odd? Mm, not like that, hardly. Uh, they look pretty realistic to me, uh, at least from the facial features. I mean, there are some asymmetries in the facial features like you would expect also in real humans. But maybe there are hints in the background or the clothes or some accessories that the people have. Yeah, right, right. So that would be one of the, the first things to look for, like glitches in the background that, that can be helpful, um, but also in the clothing. So um, there's some glitches here. And here, this is very interesting because I, I really like this example because um, what these models have challenges with is really maintaining very long range dependencies. So the, the clothing on the left shoulder should be the same as on the right shoulder. And, it, and uh, this model got the color right, but not the type of, of shirt. And this is not something a real person would wear. And uh, just to show you also the, the example from the newspaper, just to show you that this, this really can be consistently found in different examples. Uh, you see things like uh, here, this, this boy on, on the top. Um, yeah, I mentioned the first, the first thing is really residual glitches in the model. And the more most probable area to look for this is in my view in the on the hair area. So here you can see a glitch where th there's something that looks like uh, the model tried starting generating uh, sunglasses, but then didn't really commit to it and then and, and just finished it off with some normal hair. And the second, so this is one thing glitches. The second thing is um, asymmetry over long range where you don't have uh, where, where it's just details, but that really look odd. So for example, this person has an earring on this side, but not on the other. This person has two different non-matching earrings. And of course it's possible that a real person would wear this, but um, not very likely. And similar here, this person's glasses look different on the left end, on, on the right end. And this, this uh, boy's clothing as well. So long range dependencies and glitches are the two things that I would point out. And with that, that in mind, uh, let's look at these pictures again and maybe find a solution here. Charles, so, do you have so, so, so the result of the poll was uh, th a three quarter of people thought that B was the fake one, right? Yeah. Yes, and exactly. only 25% of A was the real one. Yeah. Um, I don't know the answer, but I would say for A, the, the ears look a bit strange. They don't very symmetric. Uh, uh is, is that is that a thing <laughs> yeah that, that's actually a good observation it looks a bit asymmetry asymmetrical but mm -hmm. also a bit hard to tell mm -hmm. so the answer is right the left one is actually the fake one and there's a couple of things that that are actually really subtle so i picked images with no background to, to to speak of but you can see a couple of things like here there's i think on the slide on the on the presentation here you don't really see it but there's a strand of hair that just ends mid air and is not connected to anything else to to the, the scalp and then the second one that's uh, i think is really interesting that is reflections in the eyes you, usually if you um if you have a picture of a person you have the same light sources that need to reflect in both eyes because it, those are the same light sources and in the garden generated images you would sometimes see light sources that look different so here you have three light, light spots and here you have only this one on, on that side here so you have a mismatch between the light sources in these two in the eyes yeah <laughs> and with that i i told you it's interesting that 75 percent actually thought b was fake <laughs> thank you thank you very much for the most interesting uh, presentation claudius uh, I said we, uh, it, it's, it's a bit later than I thought, but uh, in theory there's five minutes left, but if there are more questions, maybe we can extend the, the question session by five, 10 minutes. So, so we have a bit more time to talk, talk about all of this. Um, yes, there was the first, I think there was the first easy, uh, easy one from Gardin von Trapp. They was asking about unstructured versus structured data. I mean, you know, uh, at the beginning, at the end of the, the presentation, you're showing unstructured data pictures. But during most of the rest of the presentation, you were showing like a tabular structured data. 
like mm -hmm. like uh, transaction records of you know people's records. Uh, mm -hmm. Does this this framework you presented does it apply for both of both kinds of data? Is it very generic? Uh, so my personal focus is on structured data, and then also our, our company's focus. So that's that's also why I put uh, um, more info on that um, because that's why I, I'm more knowledgeable. Um, in general, you can generate synthetic of almost any type, and you might want to use different types of models depending on what types of, of data you have. So for, um, let's say, text, you would have different types of models than for images. But um, yeah, the, some of the same principles might still apply. That leads to another question that I have. Uh, would you expand a bit more on the, the use cases you guys work on? I mean, really like real real life uh, business cases where, where people are really want to work with this kind of synthetic data. Yes, sure. Um, so um, many of the business cases that we are working on are from the finance space, so banks or insurance companies, where the data they have is, is really sensitive and people need to work on, on uh, software around this data, on machine learning models, but um, it's not you cannot just share the data easily. So um, one way to solve this issue is to give them access to synthetic data so they can really de develop um, pipelines, models, and, uh, and and all of the infrastructure um, that would then also give them confidence that this works on real data as well. But so, so what you mentioned is like they use synthetic data not even to work with third parties. It's even internally they use synthetic data to increase the privacy. Yes, exactly. Actually, uh, most privacy leaks come from insiders. So there is a high risk around sharing data that is sensitive too much, even within a company. Um, of course, outside sharing is also an, an interesting use case. But I would say right now, this is being done um, very much less frequently than you would have really barriers within an organization stopping people from using data effectively. Mm -hmm. uh, there is a question from Michela, which I mean you partly addressed already during the talk. She's asking, uh, what if the data you generate matches almost exactly a real data point? Uh, you were talking about how you check the distance with real data points. So what's what you do if it's too close? Do you simply reject the, the sample? What's the procedure? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that, that's an excellent question, and um, um, I have a very strong point of view on that. Uh, the problem with exact, with these these um, just randomly incidental exact matches is that if you would remove them, you would introduce a processing step that is actually deterministically modifying the synthetic data based on some real data, and this processing step will leak information in the synthetic data. So if, for example, you would have a demographic data set and there was just, um, let's, let's, let's say I, I train a model on the population of Austria and I generate 100 billion people with this model, then if no one matches a particular uh, set of attributes, then this would mean that this person must exist um, because otherwise, just by chance, you would have to see something that, like this. And basically the post-processing is then a real big privacy risk. And, and I think it's it's a bit counterintuitive because many people would think that you would remove them, but removing them is the privacy risk. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a question for Marco who wants to, uh, you to clarify the reason why removing one data point in the original training data affect the performance so much of the models. Yeah, so these are models that, that um, are pretty much uh, using a lot of local information. And, and if you have a high capacity random forest model, then um, this will tend to somehow uh, some overfitting, right? Um, you would see, um, you saw that, for example, if you had a linear model or just a, a GLM um, classifier, then you don't have this overfitting and you don't see the, the, the this, this attribute disclosure um, from this model. But as soon as you have a model that has more capacity, you would see some, some attribute disclosure. And uh, this is what we will avoid by synthesizing the data. There's a question from Ariel. It says, so you mentioned the curse of dimensionality. Uh, in For the sake of privacy, would uh, techniques such as PCA for dimensional reduction help 
uh, in that case or not, or using a probabilistic uh, a probabilistic PCA. Is it is it the kind of generative models you're you're also considering, or you just work with GANs? Mm -hmm. um, uh, we we uh, don't use this because we um, to to some extent, of course, you can uh, increase privacy by dimensionality reduction. Uh, the the question you would have to ask here is how much do you need to reduce the data, and how sparse is this space then so if you if you reduce dimensionality from a high dimensional data space um to two dimensions then probably you're not leaking a lot of information anymore because because this distribution is, is really uh densely populated um there could be some risk still of course with outliers especially and so you need to take care of that but i mean just broadly speaking there certainly is some increase in privacy from that even though it might not be 100 percent private However, you also lose a lot of information if you go down to a very low dimension. And so you, even with PCA, if you have a complex data set, you might still want to keep it in a, I don't know, 64 dimensional space or whatever. And, and you still have the, all of these cursive dimensionality problems in that space as well. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you. There is a more operational question from Sarah. Uh, she wants to know, so practically, how do you operate with your customers? Do they still hand over their real customers' data to you? Or you hand over some service uh, or your code, basically, your platform to them? Mm -hmm. So for most customers uh, who work with very sensitive data, they prefer to have all the software on-prem. So we would never see or touch any data from, from those companies. Um, we do offer a software as a service offering as well, where you would upload data um, on our servers, and, and we are the data processors. Of course, as soon as the synthesization run is finished, the data is immediately deleted. Um, but this would require you to upload data to, to some infrastructure from our side. But how do you proceed to really building a trust with your customer? I mean, do you open your entire your entire stack and uh, source code with, to them? For or do you, are you trying not to operate as a black box, even if you if the things run on the customer's premises? Uh -huh. um, yeah, so, so there usually there's a very extensive evaluation of what happens there. Um, together with us and our data scientists, um, we, um, we, we do some proof of concepts. We do some, some detailed evaluations with privacy as well as um, business oriented contacts to evaluate whether um, this does what they expect. Sometimes they will also add some additional security uh, audits for the software, depending on uh, how much the customer is willing to invest in these evaluations. So that, that's also something that happens. Mm -hmm. Still on operation, there is Pavel asking that the example you show, in his opinion, is very uh, database uh, kind dependent. Uh, how, how do you work? Maybe do you, do you cover uh, the short case of database? Mm -hmm. uh, of course, it depends on the data set. And we've seen data sets that are easier, let's say, and, and where you would get a, a like 99% accuracy and then another one where you would get like 95% accuracy. Um, there, it's, it's impossible to give a, a comprehensive answer to any potential data set. But in practice, we've seen that um, most uh, data sets that we've been working with work pretty well out of the box without any additional tuning. Um, and, and only very special cases needed some tuning, for example, for uh, location data, we, we developed a specific um, new new elements in the model that are geared towards high location accuracy. That that was not possible out of the box. So here, it really depends on the data, and sometimes you need to add some, some additional um, modules. All right. I wanted to get back also to the use cases. There was a question from Mary. Um, if uh, if you guys work or if you could maybe say something about uh, maybe more exotic use cases or so not transaction data, not privacy record, and maybe not DNA or mobility related topics. Yeah, are there are there other use cases that uh, we we are not familiar with or we don't hear so much of? In terms of industries, use cases, as I mentioned, financial data is, is very much at the forefront. People um, trying to understand. Um, um, behavior of, of their customers and, and how they use some, some product. Um, there's also medical use cases uh, where you would 
want to share, for example, data from studies with universities. And this is also something that's uh, often difficult because of the privacy uh, of the patients that is involved. You cannot really uh, go back to study participants uh, and, and get consent for every um, university you want to share the data with. So this could help on that front as well. Um, but it's not one that we see a lot in practice. On the medical side, what we see more is on the um, health insurance side, really understanding patterns in, in the data uh, by analyzing the, the, the data they see as, as the insurance company. I see. And, and more specifically on the, the, the medical topic, I mean, you said that the DNA and genomic data in general are the hardest uh, to, to, to anonymize. Uh, is there is there any existing so satisfying solution? I mean, because I, I remember hearing from being in the field for, for some time ago that a few only a few, with few SNPs basically you can uniquely identify a human being. Yeah. Uh, what are the workarounds that are? Are there are there any solutions at all not for jamming data? <laughs> okay, <laughs> so this is not this is not solved problem. It's still, yeah. it's still a research topic. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, back to the research, you, you mentioned publications, you mentioned also some friends of yours who are doing some cool publications. Do you publish yourself? Some, some, do you participate in academic research still actively? Um, we have collaborations with you know, uh, the VUVIN, uh, mm -hmm. University of Business Administration in Vienna, um, mm -hmm. and some of our internal uh, insights we also publish on our blog, which is uh, mostly the AI. Uh, if you go to mostly.ai and uh, just go to the blog, you can also um, get more detailed articles about some of the uh, results that I showed today. And also on the, the topic of academic research, I mean, there is a exponentially growing literature on GANs. Do you, do you have time to follow up on all these developments? <laughs> and uh, maybe would you, give, would you give us a talk specifically on GANs another time in these pioneer uh, events? Uh, I think I might not be the best expert on that because the, the field is evolving re really quickly and uh, I have a more narrow view of the types of models that we specifically use for, for, our, for the structured data use cases. And a lot of what's going on in GANs is about images uh, and, and since um, in, in our company we're not dealing with images in, in practice, so um, I'm probably unaware of the majority of the research in GANs actually. Okay, we'll be talking to your friends in the research. <laughs> Good, I see uh, no longer questions. It's already almost 10 past 6 p.m. here in Vienna. I think we can call it today. Uh, thank you very much, Colius, for, for this nice presentation and the question and answer session. And uh, we hope to have you back soon. And to the audience, so the video will be made available in the next couple of days on the Vienna Data Systems Group YouTube channel, so please uh, follow it. And uh, if you want the, um, the slide specifically, please uh, simply write to Claudius, you know, go mostly I or look him up on, on LinkedIn. I have put all the links on the Meetup page, so please reach, reach, reach him directly. And yeah, sure. that's it for today. Thank you very much. Have a good evening. Okay. Good evening.